Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nisa Mackey, and I'm the Director and Curator of Education and Public Programs here at the Walker Art Centre. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to day one of Avant Museology, a two-day symposium that will engage the sociological and political implications and possibilities of museums. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our co-presenters, EFLUX and the University of Minnesota Press, um, and in particular, uh, Anton Vidokla, Brian Kwan Wood, KK Nielsen, and Amal Issa from EFLUX, Doug Amato, Peter Martin, and Emmy, Emily Hamilton from the press. And I'd also like to acknowledge the work of all of the staff at The Walker that uh, made this event happen, um, particularly Fionn Mead, Misa Jeffreys, our curatorial assistant in visual arts and public programs associate, as well as Yash Stefanski from our design department who created the wonderful design that you can see in our program um, on the slides and, <laughs> and online. Um, so one of the key prompts for this symposium came from the publication of Avant-Garde Museology by our co-presenters, uh, which was edited by our first speaker today, Arseniy Zelyev. Uh, for those of you interested in purchasing a copy of the book, uh, we'll be giving a 20% discount to ticket holders, and the book can be purchased just outside in our uh, little shop, which is across the way. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to invite Brian and Anton to deliver some opening remarks and, and make our first introductions. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Anton. I work at EFLUX. Thank you so much for coming. I know some of you came from Texas or drove for hours to come to this conference. It's really, really nice that you did that. Um, Avant-garde museology, researched and edited by artist Arseny Zhuleyev, is the first title in Eflux Classics, a new book series aiming to open the story of art to the full complexity and paradoxality of artistic thought. The contemporary museum might be the most advanced recording device ever invented. It is a place for the storage of historical grievances and the memory of forgotten artistic experiments, social projects, or errant futures. But a museum can also be the very tomb where these projects are declared dead and laid to rest, joining other elements of the past, despotic kings and their belongings, an old order stretching back centuries, perfectly preserved. This is why many artists of the early Russian avant-garde in the years surrounding 1917 October Revolution called for the destruction of the museum as fortress of history, that could only hinder the creation of an entirely new culture. Life in all its vitality must supersede art. But artists were not the only ones who realized something had to be done with the museum. Around the same time, in Russia, a number of others joined artists such as Malevich in realizing the meaning and purpose of the museum, uh, in realizing that the meaning and purpose of the museum had to be reinvented. For Arseniy Zhuleyev, these were the avant-garde museologists, a disparate group of state officials, art historians, writers, philosophers, and amateur scientists who identified the museum as a crucial site to be placed in the service of the collective production of life. While some of these thinkers are little known or completely unknown, both to readers today and to each other in their own lifetime, their placement in the avant-garde museology alongside the encompassing influences of Vladimir Lenin, Kazimir Malevich, and Nikolai Fyodorov distinguishes for the first time a mature line of thinking running through early Soviet history and society. For the editor, Arseniy Zhuleyev, the avant-garde museologists can be said to have exceeded the magnitude and imaginative scope of the early artistic avant-garde themselves. They internalized the critique of the museum voiced by artists and sought to advance its pedagogical function accordingly. If Malevich himself called for a museum of life to replace the incinerated remains of the backward past, the avant-garde museologists further asked how such a museum of life would be realized, whether through museology and curation or philosophically and temporally. 
the two-part symposium, the first part of which took place in uh, New York last weekend, and the second part in Minneapolis, is organized jointly with the Walker Art Center and hosted by the, uh, by the Walker Art Center and Brooklyn Museum. Uh, it takes the avant-garde museology book as a point of departure for a conversation about contemporary museums and the role of art, exhibitions, and museums in society today, a question that is made ever more urgent by the events of last week as we try to understand what can people in the arts contribute to the struggle against rising nationalism, racism, and fascism. Tomorrow, um, so uh, I would like to thank um, Arsenio Zhilayev, the editor of this book, the University of Minnesota Press, and especially Peter Martin and Douglas Amato, Cadiz Foundation and Victoria Foundation for all the work and support they put into this book. Of course, Walker Art Center, uh, Theon Mead, uh, Nisa, and Nisa Maki, and uh, Nisa, who helped organize the symposium. And then, of course, Amal Issa and Kay, uh, Kay, Kay Nielsen from EFLUX for uh, doing a lot of organizational work on this event and the Brooklyn counterpart of it, as well as Eric Eloven, uh, Joao, and, and, and Shuto for doing live coverage of this symposium on EFLUX conversations. Uh, we are especially grateful to all of the participants who agreed to come and take part in this. Thank you very much. And maybe Brian will say a few words now. Thanks to everyone for coming. Um, yeah, so in the first in the first iteration of this conference, kind of a kind of a dress rehearsal for for what we are we are beginning now. The first iteration last weekend at uh, at the Brooklyn Museum, we 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 had we were a bit worried because it came at the end of this um, this election cycle, and we were wondering what what. What what does what does museology have to do with the what with what is obviously on everyone's mind, and so we we tried to address it a bit and and but it seemed also that people in Brooklyn were more interested in just uh, in, in also just focusing on the on the topic at hand, but in fact there is in fact there is they are not so far away and 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 the the design of the of the conference, it, it departs from Arseniy Jelayev's uh, book, Avant-Garde Museology, but then it expands outward to try to think about what really, what is really happening with the boom of museum building happening now. What is the new kind of, what is the new, this new life being given to, to, to cultural history, to, to, to national history, in pseudo-sovereign or or, or non-sovereign territories in the Middle East, in Asia, you see museums going up like, like, like crazy everywhere, right? Historical museums, contemporary art museums. So the implicit question, and many of the, of the lectures and talks you'll see, is what is this new history that is being written now under the regime of contemporary art or under the regime of, of, of cultural heritage, right? So this is something to think about. Um, before I... Before I introduce uh, Arseny, or, or, or by way of introduction, I would like to just re read a, a, short, a, a short quote by, by Nikolai Fyodorov, who is, who is one of the most important writers for the, for the, for the book, but also for this kind of the scope of thinking that it, that it expresses. And this was in the 1880s. Nikolai Fyodorov wrote, and our age in no way dares to imagine that progress itself would ever become the achievement of history. And this grave, this museum, becomes a reconstruction of all of progress's victims at a time when struggle will be supplanted by accord and unity in the purpose of reconstruction, only in which parties of progressives and conservatives can be reconciled, parties that have been warring since the beginning of history. So for Fyodorov, the idea of the museum is some, is some kind of a strange almost metaphysical entity that can, that can unify progressive and conservatives, progress and conservation, and vit which is also a way of unifying vitality, life and death. So, <laughs> work on that one. But <laughs> just to introduce uh, Arseniy Jelayev, the, the editor of Avant-Garde Museology. Arseniy Jelayev is an artist who lives in Moscow and, Voron and Voronezh. Jelayev has presented recent exhibitions at venues such as Moderna Galleria, Ljubljana, Centre Pompidou, Paris, The Apple, Amsterdam, 
the ninth edition of Liverpool Biennial, and the 13th edition of the Biennale de Lyon. Jelayev is the editor of Avant-Garde Museology, and he has been on the editorial board of Moscow Art Magazine since 2011. Recent accolades include Russian awards in the sphere of contemporary art and a nomination for the Visible Award in 2013. Join me in giving a warm welcome to Arseniy Jelayev. Hello. Thank you, Brian, for introduction and colleagues, thank you for organizing this symposium and the general support of avant-garde museology. And thank you for coming. Obviously, if you have uh, avant-garde and museology or museum in one sentence, especially in case of uh, Western English-speaking audience, the first name that uh, comes to uh, mind is El Lisitsky and his collaboration with Alexander Donner in Ganova. Okay. Um, everyone who has an interest in experiments with display design has seen images of the abstract uh, cabinet installed in Ganova in late 1920s. Uh, this masterpiece marks the limits of the known ambitions of the transformation of the museum of that time associated with the cultural activity of a young Soviet state or even an international avant-garde in general. Uh, but uh, needless to say that the majority of uh, interpretations of the abstract uh, cabinet reduced its meaning to formal innovations distinctive to Western modernism. The very concept of the museum that appeared as a result of new social relationships and a newly developed political agenda remains uh, untouched. I'd like to take a risk to go beyond this limited discussion and describe the trajectory and logic of the transformation of the concept of the museum and art in general from the late 19th to the beginning of 20th century in Russia and the Soviet Union. This is the logic that without doubt, fed Lisitsky experimentation, but yet cannot be reduced to it. Let's use the proletarian revolution in Russia as a point of departure for our discussion about avant-garde museology. This event determined the majority of interpretations of art and the role of institutions that should preserve art not only after the revolution itself, but also served as a point of attraction and establishment of social equality even before it took place. It will be easier to describe the hierarchy of radicalization of conception of the museum and its activity in relation to revolution. And as all we know, at the foundation of this hierarchy lays, of course, the destructive impulse of the historical avant-garde towards any attempt to preserve the past. And, of course, the artist who was in charge of this treatment is Kazimir Malevich. Malevich uh, was close, closer to anarchism in terms of uh, his political preferences. But uh, at its core, this line of thinking, I mean this uh, uh, interpretation of artistic um, destruction of the museum, was inspired by the Marxist interpretation of uh, artistic creation under the condition of capitalist production and its potential transformation after the revolution. After the revolution, it was understood the emphasis of artistic activity should gradually shift from the museum towards life and production. As the resonant event, without social equality, art is mainly a getter for imaginary solutions of traumas that emerge as a result of exploitation and the class and ruling class violence against the oppressed. And the museum, in such a situation, fixes, the, uh, fixes this order of things on an institutional level under the name of art history. Consequently, Museum could be considered an enemy doomed to be destroyed. 
But uh, if society has overcome the social contradictions associated with class struggle and inequality, then art as a bourgeois ghetto should melt into liberated reality. The artist, as a special professional occupation, should gradually give way to the engineer, be it an engineer of industrial machines or social interactions, as we had in case of uh, uh, constructivism and productivist movement in uh, uh, Soviet Russia. Fairly closely aligned with the radical position of Malevich was an attempt to destroy the concept of the museum as a castle of the enemy class cl culture expressed by prolet cult. Prolet cult is mainly described as a broad movement of unprofessional poets, writers, theatrical activists, film directors and artists who tried to build a new proletarian culture through the negation of the art of previous epochs. And the intellectual leader of the prolet cult was a very interesting person uh, named Alexander Bogdanov. We have uh, his portrait here. Um, uh, he started off as uh, a professional revolutionary and a close collaborator of Lenin. There is another one, famous photo with uh, Bogdanov on the left, playing chess with Vladimir Lenin and uh, Maxim Gorky, one of the co-founders of so socialist realism doctrine. Yeah, but uh, later uh, Bogdanov uh, um, was forced to move away from political activity and started work as a scholar and cultural organizer. Thanks to Bogdanov, Prolet cult uh, was influenced by the ideas of Russian cosmism and, let's say, its unlimited creation. That's how a series of images of communistic space exploration were produced by self-taught uh, poets. In the field of exhibition making, this intuition uh, of radical freedom led, for example, to avalanche exhibitions. Worker organized and um, continually ag argument exhibitions at factories that um, exemplified a possible depiction of a new museum after the destruction of the old class enemy institution. It is interesting um, to note uh, that before revolution in 1908, um, Bogdanov depicted uh, a less radical interpretation of the museum in communistic society in his science fiction novel Red Star, a chapter of which is included in the um, book that we presented today. Um, Bogdanov, Bogdanov's version of the museum um, was later repeated by avant-garde artist and activist uh, who could not support the full destruction of Malevich, but who tried to appropriate the museum for revolutionary propaganda and the purpose of displaying, let's say, good art, which was avant-garde art, of course, and serving as a center for the education of proletarian masses. In essence, the idea was to create a museum that could answer to the professional demands of pioneering artists or to produce a museum of avant-gardism. The demands, however, focused principally on access to exhibition facilities and changes in the purchasing policy that would benefit innovative art. There was no talk of transforming the very role of the museum beyond a more active approach to exhibition and greater emphasis on the museum's undoubtedly um, important educational function. Thus, one of the important avant-garde theoreticians, Nikolai Punin, uh, whose uh, speech we had in Brooklyn, wrote The museum collections are archives to be uh, consulted freely by anyone who wishes to do so. Let the paintings be hung and rehung without any interruption. Ideally, the museum must be made entirely of moving parts. Any tendency towards the stasis of the church icon must be eradicated. His colleague, Osip Brick, opined, the contemporary museum is a scholar institute. One cannot breed contemporary European art museums out of the Kunstkammer and the repos any more than one can hatch the contemporary state directly from the feudal order. 
once museum had been repos, but, alter, uh, but, but already for a long time they have acquired a different character, an auxiliary scientific character. A professional version of the avant-garde museum appeared in Moscow in 1990 in the form of the Museum of Painting Culture. The new institution was run by artists and mainly attended by a professional audience. The approach to organizing materials was close to what later was established by Alfred Barr, in, um, uh, by Alfred Barr at the Museum of Modern Art uh, in New York. Oh, sorry. In his polemical uh, remarks on the museum bureau, the avant-garde artist Alexander Rochenko proposes fundamental changes to exhibition strategies espoused by uh, the old guard museum quotation. First of all, the gallery and the wall are construed as equipment for displaying the artwork. Under such formulation, there can be no question of economy of wall space. Wall-to-wall -wall coverage is categorically rejected. The wall is no longer construed as an autonomous entity. The artwork does not adapt itself to the wall. Instead, uh, the artwork becomes an active participant. Um, but of course, um, the Bolsheviks, uh, as a real political government, could not support the demand for the destruction of the museum as avant-gardist uh, avant and their less skilled colleagues from private cult wanted. Russia, after the revolution and the years of civil war, was a very weak and exhausted country, let's say. And it was especially important that artworks um, held not only cultural but also material value, which limited the revolutionary violence under this particular historical circumstances. Simple destruction um, was not a wise decision from a practical point of view, but um, avant-gardist appropriation of the museum as a tool for propaganda of their art also did not work very well. One possible solution to this dilemma was proposed by Leon Trotsky in his debates with Prolet Kult. His approach was uh, somewhere in between early Bolshevik support of left-wing avant-garde art and later Bolshevik support of more traditional socialist realism. Trotsky claimed the necessity of appropriation and preservation of cultural treasures of the previous epochs because a new proletarian culture could not rise from an insufficient educational background or simply a lack of the access to museums. The fetishism of unskilled art production expressed by prolet cult is not enough to build a new culture and a new free human. And moreover, it conveys the negative consequences of avant-gardist destructive impulses. On the contrary, new artists descending from workers should bring back the cultural treasures which arose on the basis of stolen surplus value. But uh, the crucial question here uh, was how to use these treasures without commanding sympathy for antagonistic classes. And uh, um, the experimental complex Marxist exposition proposed by Alexei Fyodorov Davidov and Moulton at the State Tretikov Gallery in 1931 was supposed to resolve this dilemma. The idea was to contextualize art production according to different class positions um, that were expressed by uh, various artworks. Fyodorov Davidov uh, constructed um, complexes, or let's say displays of different styles characterized by different class positions. Each display uh, consisted a number of types of artistic mediums, including furniture. Um, the, exposition, the exposition was built within a series of rooms with typical interiors of collectors from different class positions. And each room included supplementary materials about the economical and political specificities of each uh, of them. 
Thus, the proletariat could better understand the connection between art and its social background. The experimental complex Marxist exposition worked similarly to uh, alienation in the theater of Bertolt Brecht. It deconstructed the illusion of the museum as a temple of art, but left intact uh, the possibility to learning from the masterpieces of previous epochs. In addition to art already recognized by capitalist museums, Fyodor Davidov included works by uh, peasants and proletarians, political slogans and street advertisements. And for visitors who wanted to explore uh, more advanced items, let's say professional development of artistic forms through history, Fyodor Davidov organized special cabinets that repeated the logic of the avant-gardist museum of painting culture. Reappropriation of uh, bourgeois culture with an educational purpose became a dominant model in Soviet museums for a short period of time between Lenin's death and Stalin's unfolding of the socialist realism apparatus. Dialectical materialism was named the principal method of museum activity. In the most general form, this meant that in contrast to the bourgeois museum of the past, its Soviet counterpart must treat natural history, social history, or the cultural sphere not as alienated from the antagonistic or antagonistic to man, but as products of his or her conscious effort. The Kunstkammer, um, the uh, vulgar materialistic or idealistic museum would be replaced by the museum as an integral aspect of the artistic transformation of life. Passivity, neutrality, pseudo positivist or metaphysical stances of the museum with respect to the phenomena within its purview would become a thing of the past. Political engagement, partisanship, direct participation in industrial processes, in the ongoing class struggle, critique of ideological superstition, critique of fetishism, these were the new guiding principles um, and slogans of Soviet museology of late 1920s, early 1930s. And here I have um, several pictures from that period and just like to shortly uh, comment um, on them. For example, in this case, we have uh, one of the pictures from um, Museum of Revolution. And Museum of Revolutions uh, were very important for me in this uh, research. Uh, because I guess uh, museums of revolution uh, have many in common with uh, modernistic museums, but uh, I think that uh, they uh, went even further than like classical uh, museum of art. Uh, um, yes, and but it's like a big, uh, big discussion about this topic. And um, here we have um, installation dedicated to. Um, uh, to dynamite workshop. Another important thing uh, was uh, mobile exhibitions and exhibitions uh, uh, that took place uh, not in uh, at museums but uh, at factories, for example. And in this case, we have um, photos of uh, mobile laboratory one and the agate prop truck that went to uh, distant villages in order to uh, promote um, socialist construction and help uh, peasants to um, grow uh, better uh, plants with uh, uh, exhibitions and uh, special facilities. Another example uh, dedicated to uh, women liberation. Uh, I found even a um, link to Museum of uh, Women Liberation in Soviet Union in 1920s, but unfortunately uh, I could not find materials about it. But there are some just examples um, from that period about this topic. Another example from uh, Leningrad, very interesting. Uh, uh, it's a Museum of Fascism, another big and super important topic of the time. And here we can see how 
uh, avant-garde uh, display uh, close to suprematism could be um, used for um, uh, working as display of uh, uh, not not artistic museums. Another example of a museum of atheism with a famous quotation from uh, Marx. Uh, yes, but um, meanwhile, Marxist museums uh, were not uh, our final destination in my speech. And um, let's back up for a moment to the proletarian revolution and the dilemma of art after it. As uh, Boris Arvatov, theorist of productivism, suggested, even when the social contradictions uh, are resolved in advanced communist future, they will be, there will be a place for traditional media like painting and sculpture because even advanced communists will be left with uh, their physical bodies that caused possible traumas and other negative effects. And the strongest one is death and love of or sexual relations as an attempt to overwhelm death. And they need to be resolved, but only in uh, the imaginary uh, world of art, as um, Arvatov thought. Um, and art, as we know, uh, under uh, uh, capitalism. In this way, Arvatov was theorizing about the potential boundaries of avant-garde interpretation of post-revolutionary art, drawing them precisely at the point where the museum uh, proposed by Russian cosmists was to begin. The museum starts with the victory over death, resurrection, and the overcoming of the need of, for traditional sexual relationships. The idea of the museum as a stage and ground for transcending the limitations, both social and physical, imposed upon mankind can be traced back to the works of Nikolai Fyodorov, one of the most prominent um, exponents of Russian religious philosophy originator of the philosophy of the common task and founding father of the Russian Cosmism movement, which in large part inspired the Soviet space program. The idea of space colonization was a natural consequence of Fyodorov's conception of man as a transformational force in the universe, a kind of universal artist, the role of which imposes the necessity of regulations on nature and the cosmos. One of the key aspects uh, of this process, process was the resurrection of the dead and subsequent resettlement of newly resurrected generations on the planets in outer space. Space exploration, however, was not a principal tenet of Fyodorov's teaching. His common task um, consisted of the need to assume a direct control over the mechanisms of evolution and defeat death. At the same time, mere immortality would not um, suffice. The generation destined, that, uh, destined to triumph over death would nevertheless stand on the graves of all those who gave their lives in the service of this ideal. Thus, the blessed brotherhood of the sons would be forever indebted to the fathers. The ethical radicalism of the idea of indebtedness um, um, became the driving force behind Fyodorov's uh, futuristic constructs. Creative transformation of the universe and its planets into spaceships, regulation of natural phenomena on the Earth and beyond, transcendence of humanity, these are some of the striking result, results of the idea that mankind must assume an active position with respect to the debt it owes um, its dead ancestors. And one of the central places in this agenda is occupied by the museum, understood in the broadest sense of the word as an institution that can be subsumed all of man's activities in the service of the common task. Needless to say, uh, the museum, as it existed towards the end of 19th century and the beginning of 20th century, could not accommodate such an ambitious uh, project. Fyodorov mounts a um, strident critique of traditional museum practices. 
He notes uh, that the museum had often been used to enshrine mankind's poetry, strife and misconception concerning its destiny. The museum of the future, on the other hand, must be construed as a place of reconciliation and institutions that, like the church, will register every new life and every new death, but the church, which proffers an important but so far illusory intuition of immortality, must extend it to other institutions, and thus be supplemented by the museum, considered as a research facility for the preservation and resurrection of every individual in his or her physical and mental totality. Hence, the need to combine the museum with the scientific laboratory, library and uh, church school. And again, I have several images um, relate, um, related to uh, this conception of uh, museum and um, philosophy of Russian cosmism. Uh, and first uh, image is image by Lev Solovyov, and uh, this is, is a sketch to uh, for for his uh, home uh, resurrected museum, and it's uh, really strange that uh, even during Fyodor's uh, life, he tried to realize his uh, ideas in reality. He was principally. Uh, against any uh, mystification of uh, his doctrine. So he created uh, six exhibition in uh, Voronezh. And um, this uh, case is another one. Uh, this is uh, Lev Solovyov, who was uh, uh, his um, follower. And uh, he organized museum uh, in his uh, home and dedicated to his dead uh, wife. Another example of a resurrected museum. In this case, um, uh, we have uh, avant-garde artist uh, Vasily Chikrigin, uh, who was a close friend of uh, Mayakovsky and founder of Makovets uh, avant-garde uh, movement. And uh, uh, he was a big fan of uh, Fyodorov's ideas and um, wrote a um, brilliant poem. Um, on the temple of the Resurrected Museum and um, did a lot of uh, sketches for potential realization of this uh, project in reality. And uh, we even have um, correspondence from him to Nikolai Punin again about possible realization of this concept under uh, Soviet government. But unfortunately, uh, it didn't happen. Another interesting example, uh, Pantheon of the USSR that was proposed by uh, Bekhterev, a famous psychologist and uh, neurologist um, from Soviet 1920s, 30s. His idea was to uh, create an institution that will uh, preserve um, brains of uh, main important people of uh, USSR and later all people of the planet. Um, uh, with the um, idea that um, we should research uh, how they, their br brains functioned. So it was really radical, uh, but again, uh, this project was uh, realized somehow, but not um, under the name Pantone or the USSR, but under the name Institute of Brain. And it still exists uh, in Moscow. But uh, during this presentation, I found several images on the internet that one of the branch of this museum was abandoned. And um, it's how it looks right now, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, but it's interesting that brain of Bogdanov, Tsiolkovsky, Bekhterev, Mayakovsky, Krupskaya, and many others uh, important Soviet figures uh, their brains are still in the Institute of Brain. But there is no access to them, unfortunately. And one more picture <laughs> close to our reality. It's uh, Anton Vidokl new uh, movie, Immortality and Resurrection for All. And uh, we will watch uh, this uh, piece today. 
And with this image, I'd like to emphasize that I consider avant-garde museology and, uh, of course, uh, uh, museum, in the case of Russian Cosmism, as uh, kind of open projects, open for interventions of uh, scholars, of artists, um, because I guess that uh, today these ideas are pretty close to reality than it was 100 years ago. And our participation in uh, a common task, let's say, uh, could be very important for our potential uh, eternal life, let's say. Thank you for listening. Um, if you have questions, uh, I can answer them. No? Okay. Okay. Uh, as a Russian yourself, I'm curious uh, if if that last sort of uh, story you talked about the the preservation of the brain does that speak to Russian something about the Russian self that that echoes this uh, the sort of supremacist uh, out, uh, uprising up, outburst of, uh, from a hundred years previously and and are we seeing echoes of that now in a political sense in the political theater? in the global theater right now? Well, um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of confused, but I guess I'm speaking to you about the Russian character and, and how it expresses I'm, itself. You know, I'm not a big specialist in this question. Uh, I cannot evaluate the Russian character. But uh, what I can say is that, of course, this idea that appeared after proletarian revolution sounds today a little bit, you know, like a crazy, but um, I guess that uh, right now we can understand that uh, many, many ideas that appear during this period uh, right now are pretty close to reality, so they uh, look like forecast of possible future, and it means that um, they uh, they look crazy only on, on the first glance, and then we can consider them as just uh, prediction and uh, very important ideas uh, that um, appear to when limitation of the, our imagination just broke down. So, and uh, you know, I think that uh, we have, of course, this idea of uh, Institute of Brain, but we have data centers run by IT corporations that collect uh, all possible information about us, uh, I guess including biological, because Google wants to establish a uh, medicine care um, branch. And we have uh, secret services that collect, again, uh, a lot of information about our lives. And all these things um, look pretty close to uh, possible realization of uh, Fyodorov's ideas, even more mad than just uh, Pantheon of the USSR. But of course, in case of Fyodorov, such type of interpretations uh, were not possible because he was uh, against uh, capitalism and against any uh, violence and political control and aggression. So uh, it means that, again, uh, maybe our days is um, mm, not so far from, from the beginning of the 20th century. And now, again, possible intervention, interventions and reinterpretations and struggle for the possible realization of this project uh, is really important. Thank you no. for your talk. Um, my question is about the lumpen proletariat and if there was any part of a radical left imagination um, that considered the lumpen proletariat in this sort of avant-garde museology and if 
not, why do you think that is? Lumpen proletariat, I, I didn't hear well. Yeah, I don't know. Should I rephrase or? Yeah, if it's possible and louder. This group that's sort of that's sort of outside of Marxist Marx mm -hmm. thinking about the proletariat, this mm -hmm. lump and proletariat mm -hmm. that's sort of um, cast out, disregarded, and thought to be um, not not able to be politically activated. Okay. So in avant museology, mm -hmm. there is this. This is a radical proposition. The spaces that they're thinking about, the ideas that they want to put forward. Where's the lump? Is there a lump and proletariat okay, in that I radical got... imagination? So first of all, I can refer you to this avalanche exhibition and prolet cult movement, because prolet cult movement uh, was precisely about this type of uh, lump and proletariat. Let's say because they were like outsiders and they didn't have um, had not had participation in cultural policy before revolution and uh, yeah and their activity uh, were very problematic for uh, Bolsheviks because they um, were even more uh, popular than official supported avant-garde uh, artists and uh, yeah, and then, for example, in case of uh, Marxist uh, uh, expositions and Marxist museology, it is interesting that uh, they consider them as kind of educational uh, exhibitions, but uh, of course uh, they were close to really advanced conceptual critical installations. And for people uh, who didn't have enough um, educational background, didn't have enough like participation and culture. They were uh, very difficult to, uh, to, to be understood somehow. So they criticize this as well. And I guess maybe it was one of the possible reasons why uh, all this experimentation uh, was uh, were closed in uh, 30s and uh, um, Instead of it, uh, uh, was established uh, more classical, uh, traditional uh, expositions uh, that uh, were more suitable for just uh, ordinary people without um, background in uh, in art. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, my question is, uh, what is your take on the uh, current contemporary museums in Russia? Like given, uh, given that they are being funded by government or by huge corporations like uh, BP or BMW, uh, do you think that there is still space for the, for the concept of avant-garde museology? Oh, <laughs> in two words, I would say that... M maybe you know some contemporary examples, like some examples. Yeah. It's really strange, but uh, uh, if you go in Moscow um, to a museum of contemporary Russian history, which is former museum of revolution, you can find uh, more or less the same exp uh, exposition from Soviet time. So they somehow preserved uh, all um, their uh, expositions from Soviet time. And uh, it's really strange because it's not possible in public uh, media in Russia to speak about revolution, censorship, etc., like struggle against censorship against, against government. But uh, in the very heart of the museum uh, network, you can find all these materials, how to produce bombs, how to uh, struggle against uh, censorship, etc., etc. So there is a blind spot <laughs> in this system. But uh, uh, I guess because of the uh, next uh, first coming anniversary of proletarian revolution in um, next year, they will reconstruct um, all this exposition. 
uh, and try to find like another way uh, for uh, interpretation of these facts. And um, of course, I think that unfortunately there is no place for um, such type ambitious projects today because uh, it was possible, I guess, with strong support from our government, from like uh, revolution and uh, social experimentations. But uh, I think, uh, and it, it's my like principal uh, idea, that uh, we can use contemporary art and even contemporary museums for um, experimentation in this, in this field, because um, artist uh, has a more broader freedom than uh, curator from the museum, and uh, possibly uh, we can produce together uh, together. Mm -hmm. like new interpretations of the same ideas uh, that could be in future um, realized in like real uh, museums uh, after the revolution, <laughs> of course. Okay, thank you.